or whenever. We just wanted to give them, we always give a few minutes so they can yeah. see all the slides and see the crap. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to let you know. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Marine Biological Laboratory and the MBL Falmouth Forum. My name is Gina Hebert and I'm the MBL's Director of Communications. I want to thank all of those, those of you who are joining us in person tonight here in the Cornelia Clapp Auditorium, as well as all of you who are joining us virtually. Before we get started on tonight's presentation, I want to take a moment to thank the Falmouth Forum Committee. Um, they're a committee of the Friends of the MBL, and they do all of the great work bringing free cultural enrichment to our community and speakers like Dr. Hodes. They work throughout our community and, th and mainly through the Falmouth Forum series. So thank you all, those of committee members who are here tonight. This series is supported by an endowment that was established by a generous group of individuals, foundations, and organizations. And they bring the program that we bring to the community. It's directly related to the support of the endowment. I'm pleased to share that with a generous matching gift of $25,000, we have surpassed the midway point of our $100,000 goal. But there is more work to be done. I hope that those of you who are here tonight and those of you who are watching virtually will consider supporting the forum endowment and helping us reach our goal. There are several ways that you can give. You can scan the QR code with your phone right now. Um, you can also, at the back of the auditorium, there are ways to give cash, to give cre by credit card, or even just an old-fashioned mailer that you can mail back to us. Um, in any way that you choose to support, we appreciate it, and just know that your donation is going towards bringing programming like this to our local community. And if you've already made a donation, thank you very much. Before I hand it off to our introducer, I'd like to remind those of you who are in the auditorium to just make sure your cell phones are silenced. And now I'd like to tone it, turn it over to Dr. Mike Fishbein, a member of the Falmouth Forum Committee, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so on behalf of the MBL and the Falmouth Forum Committee, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Falmouth Forum Lecture, delivered by Dr. Rick Hodes. I first became familiar with Rick's work when a friend recommended I read a book called This is a Soul. It's written by Marilyn Berger, and it chronicles Rick's medical work in Ethiopia. Way back when, I had dabbled a bit as an international medical volunteer in Central America, 
and I had some understanding of the difficulties in delivering even basic medical care to rural villages. And I was simply blown away by Rick's work. He was not only delivering basic medical care, but he was treating cancer, spinal deformities, and complex heart disease. Over the course of three decades, he treated thousands of patients, many with complex medical and surgical problems. Each of these patients would have otherwise gone untreated. In a sense, I like to think that every patient that Rick treats is a miracle. And I hesitate to use that word miracle because it means different things to different people. But certainly from the perspective of a patient, this is appropriate. For youngster living with spinal tuberculosis in a remote village without electricity or running water, and then to ultimately be restored to health, what is that if not a miracle? So as you hear Rick's stories, I'd like you to try to imagine what it must be like to live for years completely without hope, and then one day to have your crooked spine and life made straight. Rick requested that I keep my comments short, so I'll just ask you to stay with that thought just for a moment while I introduce Rick Hodes. So please give Rick a warm welcome. He's come all the way from Ethiopia to be here with you tonight. Sorry, I have to figure out how to do this. This. Okay, so it seems to be working. Now, here's this. Change my glasses. It's like my to-do list, you know? It's like, in medicine we say I'm doing a procedure. <clears throat> Greetings. Hello. Shalom, Anastaling. Um, thank you so much for coming. So my name is Rick Hodes. I'm from Syosset. I graduated from Syosset High School in 1971. Michael is slightly older and uh, much wiser than I am, but he graduated <coughs> from Syosset High School as well. He didn't tell us that, but uh, I'm telling you, spilling the beans. And... Um, I've been a doctor in Ethiopia for 33, 34 years now. So let me introduce you to one of my patients. This is a kid named Danny. You see this picture? Several years ago, a woman came to me and she said, Rick, I've spent a day with you in clinic. And I know how to diagnose tuberculosis of the spine. And I was walking on the street, and I saw this kid who had TB of the spine, I'm sure. So this is somebody who didn't have any medical background. And I wasn't quite sure of her diagnostic skills. But I'm, I'm sure she recognized, truly, a spinal deformity. So I said, well, let's go find this kid. So we got in my car, and we drove to the area. For those who understand Amhara, I'm Ms. Kilo Akababi. And we started looking for this kid, and the kid was not in the area at all. Now, how do you figure out what's going on in a certain neighborhood anywhere in Ethiopia? Who do you go to? Do you go to the mayor? Do you go to like the head of the what they call the Kabele, the uh, Neighborhood Association? No way. Who knows everything? It's the Listros. It's the Shoeshine Boys. They sit there. They know everything. And so my assistant went to the Shoeshine Boys, and he said, do you know a kid with a bad back? And he said, yeah. His name is Danny. And... He has no parents, 
But he lives on his own. He sleeps on the floor of a video store. And during the day, he begs for money to support himself and feed himself. And we'll tell you how to get to the video store. So they took my assistant to the video store. My, video, my assistant said to the video store owner, listen, there's a doctor from America who wants to help this kid. <clears throat> Give us a call when he shows up. And he said, OK. So we exchanged phone numbers. Two hours later, my phone rang twice and then stopped ringing. He didn't want to pay for a call, but he was willing to let it ring twice. They call, in Ethiopia, they call that flashing. So he flashed me. And we called him back and said, what's the story? And he said, Danny is here. You can come get him. Now, I was a bit well known in this area because some months before, I had treated somebody with multi-drug resistant TB, and I had to give him an injection into his arm three times a week of TB medicine. And because I was doing that, and I did that outside because I didn't want to be exposed to him, people in the area knew me, and they knew that I was an OK guy who was trying to help them. So when my team and I showed up, and we said to Danny, listen, we want to help you, he said, and they said, go with him. It's going to, hurt. It's going to be good. So he said, OK. So I took Danny's hand, and we're walking to my car, and somebody snapped this picture. So you can see, this is an un unkempt, thin kid with unfitting clothes who was trying to stay clean, but really was not doing a great job. And he's being led to my car to go to Mother Teresa's mission and see what we could do for him. OK? And then I took my medical pictures. So this is typically what happens to somebody when they have TB of the spine. Everybody knows TB is a lung disease, but TB can actually affect any organ of the body. It can affect the knee, it can affect the heart, it can affect the kidney. And in Africans and in Asians, it often affects the spine. And it doesn't cause scoliosis. It doesn't cause an S. It causes kyphosis, which is a big V. And so he, he had a big V. He was very thin, no muscle mass at all, um, but still managing to smile a bit. And I was taking these pictures. So these are the initial pictures that I take on all of my spine patients. There he is, bending over, showing us his flexibility, but also showing us the degree of his deformity. And this is really very bad, because this is a kid who's quite small. He's probably eight years old. He has a lot of growing to do. And he has a real severe deformity. When I look at this, now let's see if I can figure this out. OK, so um, this is his spine. And you can see. Here you see a regular bone, here's a regular bone, here's a regular vertebra. But then you have a mass over here, like three or four bones that are fused together. So he had such an intense inflammatory reaction that several of his bones just fused together. And we see this in our severe spine patients. So this is a very big deal. And if you want to operate on them, you have to break these bones. You have to do what's called osteotomies. And technically, this is a very difficult thing. So I kept on my evaluation. Here's his x-ray. So you can see here's the outline of his spine, and here you see some individual bones. But I want to point out, you see this thing here? This deformity here is actually inside the lung. So besides TB of the spine, he also had TB of the lung. Now, I've treated 1,000 cases of TB of the spine, and I've only had about three who had simultaneous TB of the spine and the lung together. But it made it much more difficult. And I'm not going to go into the details, but he was a very sick boy. And we weren't sure whether he was getting better or getting worse. But I stuck to my treatment, consulted some experts, gave him nutritional feeding to the best I could. And he started getting better. So here he is. We became friends. Here we are having a snack in the middle of the day together. He got better. We treated his TB. And here he started going to school. 
You can see he's very proud to wear a uniform, to have a Spider-Man backpack. Natalie Portman came to visit, and she paid a visit to him. And uh, here we are at the Sheraton Hotel, and <clears throat> Natalie was very happy to see him. And then I sent him off to my partner organization called FOCUS, F-O-C-O-S, in Accra, Ghana. Here he is after his surgery. So that big V is gone. And if you took it, take a look at his back. He has these screws, and then he has this cage. So what they did is they actually removed several bones, and they put the cage in as a spacer in between. So he's actually in OK shape and was ready to continue his life. So here we are in Africa. Um, there are actually, anyone know how many countries there are? Actually, I had to look this up today. It's, there's 59. Um, so there's 59 countries. Actually, that's interesting. I wonder if they counted South Sudan. I, I don't know. Anyway, there should be 59 countries. And here we, here we go. Here's the map of the continent. Now, here you see simultaneously the African continent and North America laid on top of it. I just wanted to show this to show you how bigger Africa is, much bigger than North America. Okay? Here you have the individual countries. We are in Ethiopia. Um, and then I'm going to show you the regions. So you have North Africa, these four or five Muslim countries over here. Um, then you have the Sahel, which is really mostly desert there. You have the East African region, um, where I am, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Kenya, Tanzania, and so on. You have um, West Africa here, the Great Lakes area here, and then Southern Africa. Okay, so here we are in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the largest landlocked country in the world. It's about the size of Colorado times four. Okay, and you can see our neighbors are Eritrea to the north, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, and Sudan. Okay, people think because we're in Africa that it's hot and it's a desert. Actually, two thirds of the land, two thirds of the one third of the land, and two thirds of the population are in the Highland Plateau. So it's about eight, ten thousand feet above sea level. It's green in the rainy season. It's really quite beautiful. Here we have the town of Gondor. We're overlooking this area here, and right over here is a castle that I'll show you in a moment. So this is the, the castle of King Fossil. Uh, there's not a lot of castles in Africa, but we have a really nice one, okay? If you want to buy a chicken in the town of Gondor, you don't go to Safeway. You go to this gentleman who's standing on the street with these live chickens, and <clears throat> you negotiate a price, you carry home this live chicken upside down like a stalk of celery, and then at home it's slaughtered by a man. Women do not slaughter animals. And then it's eaten by all. Okay, let me just point out, I don't want to overload you with statistics, but just point out some information. So we are 1.39 billion people, 17% of the world's population. Ethiopia, and I updated these figures today, Ethiopia has 120 million people. America has 330 million. Nigeria, which is by far the most populated country in Africa, has 215. We have a <clears throat> life expectancy of 66. America's life expectancy because of COVID has dropped from 79 to 77. We, our population in Ethiopia is growing 2.6% um, a year. In America, it's 0.35%. So we have 2.9 million extra people every year in Ethiopia. The population of Africa will double uh, by 2050, and we will be 20, greater than 25% of the world. But we're young. The, average, the median age in Ethiopia is 18. Median age in America is 38. And we're poor. The Ethiopian GNI, Gresh National Income, is $850. In America, we're 65,000. We are about two thirds Christian and one third Muslim. <clears throat> Literacy rate is about half. About half the population has electricity. A large amount of people are underweight at birth. 5.5% of Ethiopian women die in childbirth. <clears throat> 
in their lifetime. So your chances of dying in childbirth in Ethiopia are much greater than your chance of dying in heart surgery in America. Um, our HIV rate is maybe 1% or so. In America, it's one in every 273 people. We have 450,000 Ethiopians on free HIV meds, thanks to George Bush and the PEPFAR program. And I, I updated these figures today on COVID. So America has had 81 million cases of COVID. Ethiopia's had 470,000 cases. So in America, one in every 259 people has died of COVID above the age of 18. In Ethiopia, it's one in 8,400. Okay, we have one doctor for every 13,000 people. In America, we have one doctor for every 349. Um, male circumcision rate is about 92%. Female circumcision rate is dropping, but it's 65%. There's a huge brain drain. Um, and there's, the, according to the US ambassador, there's more Ethiopian doctors in Washington and Maryland than in all of Ethiopia, and you can see the Economist is announcing Africa's population will double by 2050. Okay, this is just a view of the countryside. This is a typical Ethiopian house. The family got a bit of money, and this is their new house with a tin roof. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk about um, my history. And so I grew up in Syosset. I went to Middlebury College, got a degree in geography, was not sure what I was going to do uh, with, my, with my life. I hitchhiked to Alaska. I lived in Alaska for several years. Decided the best thing I could do is go to medical school. So I went to medical school in Rochester, New York. <laughs> Trained in internal medicine in Baltimore. Then I got a Fulbright Fellowship. And I moved to Ethiopia to teach at the medical school. Taught at Addis Ababa University um, for several years in the 1980s. I left and was doing other things. Came back in 1990 to work for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, who I work for now. Um, what had happened was there was an ancient Jewish population in Ethiopia. Um, early travelers had described their situation. They described that there was this ancient Judaic history. And then they sort of disappeared, and they showed up again in the 1800s. <clears throat> Um, nobody knew how many people there were. In the 1980s, there was a movement of Ethiopians who left Ethiopia and went to Sudan that was called Operation Moses. Um, and then in November of 1989, Ethiopia and Israel reestablished diplomatic relations which had been broken off after the 1973 war. Ethiopian Jews heard about this, and they started migrating to Addis Ababa. So by the summer of 1990, there was about... 15, 20, 25,000 Ethiopian Jews in Addis Ababa. The JDC, my employer, started a medical program and several months later hired me to be the director. So we had a clinic, we had an immunization program, we had a nutrition program, we <clears throat> had a modern tuberculosis program, and we had health facilitators. The death pop of the population, uh, the death rate decreased significantly. And there's a civil war going on, and uh, the, it was getting closer and closer. So all of this is happening, and we didn't know what was going to happen. Ethiopian Jews were leaving for Israel in an orderly fashion at about 1,000 a month. So in May of 1990, um, towards the middle of the month, I got two people who came into my clinic. There was a husband and a wife. The wife was pregnant. She had malaria. Now, malaria in pregnancy is a very terrible thing because the placenta becomes like a magnet for the malaria parasite. And you can easily kill the mom and e easily kill the fetus. So the mother needed a blood transfusion. I was willing to give my own blood. The husband didn't weigh enough to donate blood, but I needed another blood donor. So I said, OK, I'm going to go to a shoeshine boy. So I found my shoeshine boy, who I did business with on a weekly basis. And I said, how much money do you make a, a, a month? And he said, $5. And I said, OK, I want to offer you $20 right now. And he said, let's go. And I said, OK, we're going to donate blood. 
So we went to the blood bank, and the blood bank was very, very clean and well run. And like any of us who walked in would be quite happy to donate blood there. But Ethiopians culturally don't like donating blood. And so when he saw all of it, they don't think it's a retrievable substance. So once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and so when he saw all this blood, you know, the big blood bag there, there's no way that he was going to donate blood. And I said to him, well, you know, there's a pregnant woman who can die. And he said, I don't care. It's not my relative. So I needed to come up with a plan B. I went to the Hilton Hotel. I ran into Uri Lubrani. Uri Lubrani was the Israeli negotiator. And he said to me, Rick, we just got permission. Tomorrow's the day all the Ethiopian Jews are flying to Israel. So all of this is going on. And I figured there must be Israelis there. And so I was walking around the lobby of the Hilton Hotel listening for Hebrew. There, <clears throat> I heard three guys speaking Hebrew. I walked up to them and I said, Shalom. My name is Dr. Rick Hodes. I'm medical director of the American Jewish Joint. I need somebody to donate blood with me right now. And they looked at me. They looked at me like I was asking them to donate a kidney. And nobody said a word. So I smiled. And I said, good afternoon. My name is Rick Hodes. And I completely repeated what I said. I need somebody to donate blood for me right now. And one guy finally looked up and he said, I can't donate blood. And I said, why not? And he said, tomorrow is going to be a really busy day. And I don't want to be tired. And I said, I lost it. I said, doesn't anyone give a shit? I said, there's a pregnant woman who's going to die. And you're worried about being tired tomorrow? And I just stormed out of there. This guy, whose name is on the record, Boaz Bismuth, got up, ran after me, held my shoulder. He said, doctor, let's go. And I said, why'd you change your mind? And he said, I have a pregnant wife. And so we went, and he donated blood. He was nervous about it, but when he saw it, he said, everything's fine. So, and we became friends. And he said, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm getting the Jews out of the hospitals. And he said, well, I'm going to follow you. So the next morning, we got up, and we called together this group called the committee. The committee was the 20 most educated people in the 15,000 Ethiopian Jews who was left in Addis Ababa. And we said, go to every single house, tell them, drop everything, get, bring only your medical records, any x-rays you have, and that's it. Show up at the Israeli embassy, and we will get you <clears throat> to Israel. So my job that day was getting people out of the hospital. And I drove across the city in the morning traffic to a hospital, the a leprosy hospital, where I had this young teenager who had both tuberculosis and leprosy, two mycobacterial diseases. And I found him, and I said to him, Mandefro, we can go to Israel today. Let's go. And he said, is she? OK. Now, the doctors around him said, who are you? You can't just take a patient out of the hospital. So I went to the hospital director, and I didn't want to tell him that the largest civilian airlift in world history was going to start within a couple of hours. Uh, so what I said was, I'm from the Embassy of Israel. There's a flight to Israel today of patients, and this kid qualifies. So he says, I want a letter from his mother. So I said, well, I'm not sure who his mother is, but how about a letter from the Israeli ambassador? He said, no, well, that would be great. So I got the ambassador on the phone, and I said, can you fax over? This is the days of the fax machine. Can you fax over a letter? And he said, well, our fax machine is broken. So, you know, and this is early in the morning. I have this massive to-do list, and I'm wondering how many things didn't go wrong that day. I went back to see the kid, and the team was on some other part of the, of the ward. And I literally, he's a small kid, and he's malnourished. I picked him up, and I ran as fast as I could. <clears throat> put him in my back seat of my car. I covered him with newspaper. I actually had brought newspaper for that purpose. And Boaz and I drove out as the team was running after us. And, you know, Ethiopians are good runners. <laughs> but we made it out and put him on the floor of my clinic. My next stop was another hospital called Yekata 12. And in Yekata 12, I had a kid with meningitis. And I said to the mom, 
today is a flight to Israel, and you can go. And she's, this is, again, 10 in the morning. She said, my brother said to wait here. He's going to meet me at 3 in the afternoon. So I lied. I said, your brother's waiting for you at the Israeli embassy. I mean, he must have been, right? So she said, nope, I'm not leaving. So what could I do? I drove back to the Israeli embassy. By this point, I parked like half a mile away because there were all these people streaming into the Israeli embassy. And you also had all their neighbors who heard, like, something's going on. We want to see. So there were thousands of people. It's like a crowd going into Yankee Stadium. And if you look at the people going into the, into the embassy that day, you could see a man with a baby on a kid on his neck and a couple of kids in his arms and a pregnant woman and maybe a blind mother-in-law. It reminded me of the Torah portion that we read on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And it, you know, it talks about the four groups of people going to go to Israel and make Israel a great nation. And they don't talk about Jewish doctors from Syosset. Who do they talk about? This is, Jeremiah is talking about the blind, the lame, pregnant women, women in labor. That's what's going to make Israel a great nation. And that's what you saw going into the embassy that day. So I walked in the middle of all these people, and some guy tapped me on the shoulder. And I said, Mindano, what do you want? And he said, doctor, you need to help me. My sister's in Yekata 12 Hospital. Her kid has meningitis, and I'm here. What should I do? This is like a needle out of a haystack tapping me on the shoulder. Really, it's a true story. And I said, you're exactly what I want. Come with me. And so we got in the car. We drove to the hospital. She he just stood at the door. She looked up, and she said, is she? OK. And then she agreed to leave, and we all went back and uh, put her on the floor of the clinic. So I got a few more people out of the hospital, and then I sat down to write medical summaries. My head nurse, my wonderful head nurse, his name is Sister Dana, came up to me and she says, Dr. Rick, you're making a mistake. And I said, what's the problem? She says, these people are hungry. They need to eat, and you need to eat. And I said, we don't have any food. And she said, well, you know, look in our container. So this is May of 1991. April of 1991 was Passover. And as the Jewish organization that I work for, the JDC, does all over the world, we sent in a large packing container of matzah. But it wasn't cleared out of customs until 10 days after the holiday ends. So we had thousands of boxes of matzah. So people were sitting on their homemade mattresses, because we had a mattress factory. And we gave them each a bottle of matzah, a box of matzah. Now, Mr. Slimfast, remember Slimfast? Mr. Slimfast, God bless him, had donated thousands of packets of Slimfast. So we made big vats of Slimfast. And they sat on their matzah, their mattresses, eating matzah and drinking slim fast. Now, we all know, um, many of you have been to Passover seders. And you know the Jews have the story that Jews were in the desert in Egypt, and they couldn't bake their, their bread. So they bake their, put the dough on, on the hot rocks and, rocks, and it turned into matzah. Um, so this is in the middle of, Ethiopian Jews are in the middle of their exodus. And they're eating matzah as well. But of course, this is 90, 1991, so they get slim fast to add to it. Um, and then we went and drove all these people to the airport. And they flew off to Israel. So that day, 39 flights flew into the country. Uh, 14,400 people flew out. A 747 took off with 1,079 people. By the time it landed four hours later in Israel, it had 1,080 people because there were babies born that day. So that day, I think we had seven babies born. Nobody died. And uh, <clears throat> all these people ended up in Israel. So they flew from Ethiopia in the middle of the Red Sea, got to Israel. And uh, here you see them getting off the plane and onto a new life. And so my job for the next six weeks was identifying my patients with tuberculosis so we could restart them on treatment. And then I went back to Ethiopia and continued my medical care of the remaining immigrants. So 
I've been the doctor for about the last, I don't know, 75, 80,000 immigrants to Israel. So I've really been the doctor for 1% of Israel before they became Israeli. And here is, you see these people getting off the plane. Um, and I came back to Addis Ababa. And I started volunteering at Mother Teresa's mission. So this changed my life in many ways. And in 1991, I met these guys. These are abandoned orphans with tuberculosis of the spine. And you can see the guy on the left has a 120 degree angle. The guy on the right has a 90 degree angle. Um, they seem quite happy, but they have really bad backs. And there's a high chance they're going to be paralyzed unless they get surgery. Well, I wanted to get them surgery, um, but nobody would touch them. And nobody would touch them for free because this is such technically difficult stuff. Well, I was thinking about this because I didn't want these boys to become paralyzed. Then I got this brilliant idea. I could adopt them, add them to my health insurance, and bring them to America and get them surgery in America. Now, the problem is when you adopt an abandoned orphan who doesn't have any relatives, they become yours for life. So on one hand, I could save their lives. On the other hand, we'd have to spend the rest of our lives together. Did I want that much permanence? So this really bothered me. And I thought about it for a few days. And I was walking along. And I looked up at the Almighty. And I just said to him, I guess it's a him, huh? Um, we have to be careful about gender these days, I know. Um, I said, what do you want me to do? And this true story, a few days later, it's as if, as if he sent me a fax to my brain, because the answer arrived. And the answer was this. I'm offering you a chance to help these boys. Don't say no. So I said, OK. So I adopted them, added them to my health insurance. And like every step is difficult. You know, like what I'm saying in a sentence takes a month. Um, and then brought them down to Dallas, Texas, where they had surgery. So here they are after their surgery. OK, this is a real picture. OK, this is the younger one and me balancing each other. We sent this picture to the surgeon with a caption, spinal stress test successful. <laughs> OK, now, if you want to try this with one of your sons, the person in my position has to weigh about 20 pounds more than the other guy. OK, we tried it the other way, because his position is actually a bit easier, but it didn't work out that way. So try it. But uh, the heavier one has to, be, has to have good abs. And I started treating spine patients. And so we got, I, I had this reputation that I could help spine patients, and I was getting more and more. So another kid with a bad back came along. And I adopted him and added him to my insurance and got him surgery in America as well. But like, serial adoption is probably not the answer to spine deformity. So I had to come up with a better solution. And the solution arrived a few, day, a few years later with a unique name. The name is Ohenaba Boachi Aje. Okay? Dr. Boachi is, in my opinion, the greatest guy and the finest spine surgeon in the world. And we've worked together for well over a decade, and we've done over a 1,000 surgeries. So I was working at Mother Teresa's mission. I wanted to show you some of the kids that I was taking care of. This is a kid. This is a large soft tissue tumor. This is called Burkitt's lymphoma. This is an orphan from far out in the countryside with this huge tumor, which is getting bigger in front of my eyes. So I went to a bunch of pharmacies, and I made a list of all the cancer drugs that they had. And then I came and called my friend, and we sat and we, over the phone and by email, we figured out a combination that we could use. It's sort of like if you want to bake a cake, you make a list of all the possible ingredients, and then you say, I'm going to use this much sugar and this much flour and this much water and so many eggs. So we put this all together. And here's this kid when he started. Here he is getting his chemotherapy. Um, every three weeks, I had to sit him up and give him an injection into his spinal canal. This would take me about two minutes, no anesthesia. He's a tough kid. He did great. Um, and there he is when he finished. So 
twelve hundred dollars of indian generic drugs we saved this kid's life and the kid is fine okay then i got a call one day from a catholic nun that there was a muslim boy who was attacked by a hyena and he lost his scalp he lost his eye he lost his ear and he lost the top of his jawbone and she wants to know whether i could help well i said send me the kid now i'm not going to show you these the medical picture because it's not for a general audience. But you can imagine, all of that is open and raw. And the kid was really psychologically traumatized. Well, here they, here's the kid, and I interviewed him. My son, Adisa, was doing the translation, and the father said, my son was out playing with his friends. I heard some noise. I looked out the window, and I saw him being attacked by a hyena. And the dad said, I said to myself, if this hyena is going to kill my son, he's going to have to kill me first. And Adisu turned to me and he said, you know, I think this is the definition of unconditional love. So the father risked his own life, starts fighting with the hyena, knowing that a hyena, one bite from a hyena can kill you. The hyena fortunately ran away. And he thought his son was dead. He brought his son to this Catholic hospital. The wonderful nuns there nursed him back to health. And six months later, he was ready for major surgery. So they contacted me. I didn't know what to do. But my friends from Dallas, my host family, was visiting. And that night, over dinner, I just said, you wouldn't believe this kid I got today. He was attacked by a hyena. He needs so much plastic surgery. I don't know what to do. My friend, who's a restaurant owner, turned to me and he says, you know, Rick, I'm active in this organization called Friends of the Western Galilee Hospital in northern Israel. Do me a favor. Send me the information. I'll send it on. I said, no, okay. <clears throat> nothing, nothing to lose. So I made him a PowerPoint. I sent him the information. The next day, the head of the hospital called me. He said, Dr. Rick, we want this kid. So here we are. We got this kid a passport, got him a visa, drove him to the airport, put him on the plane. He spent nine weeks in the hospital, uh, in and out of the hospital, had three long surgeries. He came back a new, confident kid. He had three suitcases of clothes. He had more clothes than Imelda Marcos. <laughs> and he was a brand new person. And then he went on television in Ethiopia saying, Israel is the greatest country in the world. No other country could have done this, and they saved my son's life. So it was like, an amazing situation, and this kid became so much better. OK, now sometimes the Almighty just intervenes in amazing ways. And this happens, this has happened like 20 or 25 times in my life. I actually have a list on my computer. I told one story the other day to Cory Booker at a Passover Seder, and he made a TikTok video out of it. But here's this woman who is a Muslim orphan at Mother Teresa's mission who had a tumor. You can see this area here is about the size of an orange, and it's squashing the top of her brain. Um, so this shouldn't be there. And whether it's cancer or not doesn't really matter. It's still going to kill her. So here she has a terrible tumor. Okay, Why is this woman alive today in 2022? Because I went to synagogue in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I put on tefillin which is what observant Jews do, one on the arm and one on the head. We do this every morning. What happened? Normally, I do this every morning. Today, I did it in uh, Michael's upstairs bedroom. But I was in Minneapolis, and I overslept. And I didn't have time to do morning prayers. So after my first meeting, I said to the guy taking me around, do me a favor. Take me to a synagogue. I would just want to do my morning prayers properly. So he took me to a synagogue, and I said hello to the guy next to me. He said, hi. And I said, what do you do here in Minneapolis? And he said, I'm a skull-based neurosurgeon. And I said, well, that's interesting. Let me show you something. So I opened up my computer. This is November in Minneapolis, OK? You know, it's really cold. You don't want to keep your computer in your car. So I had my computer with me in the synagogue. I opened up the computer, and I'm showing him these scans. And he says, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. Let's talk. So after the synagogue, after the services end, 
we exchanged information. I sent him all the stuff, and he gave me an appointment six months in advance, and he said, bring her to me, and we will operate for free. So we got him, we got her a visa, we got her a passport, got her a visa, flew her off to Minneapolis, and here she is after. So this is a Muslim orphan raised by Catholic nuns at Mother Teresa's mission, getting free surgery at St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota by Dr. Eric Nussbaum and his team. It's the whole world working together. And uh, I think that's the way the world's supposed to be. And then I get these cases. Here you see a normal skull from the teeth up. This looks like, look like a bowling ball, doesn't it? Well, this poor lady, that's what she looked like. If they gave gold medals in the Olympics for jaw tumors, she would have a gold medal because she has the world's largest jaw tumor. Okay, and somebody told me there was a surgeon in Germany who could help us. So, you know, you hear this stuff all the time. I write letters, usually I strike out, but maybe five, 10%, something good happens. He wrote back and he said, I'd like to talk to you. We're gonna talk, we're gonna try to see what we can do. So some months later, they had secured the money, they had secured permission, and I covered her. She happens to be a Christian, but we needed to cover her to get on the plane, put her in this burqa, we flew her off to Munich, Germany, and here she is. She had a 17-hour surgery. They removed the whole lower jawbone. They made a new jawbone out of the fibula, the, the, lower, the bone in the lower part of the leg, the minor bone there, and gave her dental implants. She's now a nanny for a German diplomatic family living in Geneva, Switzerland. She has a brand new life, and you can see we've completely transformed her life. Now, this kid that I'm going to talk to you about right now is named Sintayo, and he actually is supposed to be listening. So, Sintayo Tanaslingatai. I'm going to take a drink of water and continue. Okay, so here we are. This is Sintayo. So, here he is when he first came to us. He has a right-sided curve, but when you look at the 3D reconstruction on the CAT scan, this is unbelievable. Like, I'm not even sure how do you measure that angle, but it's probably about 200 degrees when you go up and around and so on. And this is how he was living, and this was squashing his lungs, and so if he got pneumonia, he would have no reserve and he would die. Okay, now you can see me in all my glory. I'm five foot three, okay? Um, and, but if you look at the two of us next to each other, he's a lot shorter than me, but look at this. Look at his belt and look at my belt. So our belts are the same, okay? So he should be at least my size, but look at my chest and look at his chest. His FVC, his force vital capacity, was less than two cans of Coca-Cola. And we live at 8,000 feet above sea level. So he had no reserve. So he's sort of a ticking time bomb. If he got pneumonia, that would be it. So here he is beforehand. We sent him off to our hospital in Ghana. Here he is after four months of traction. I'll tell you guys about traction. And there he is. During surgery, he ended up with five rods. And there you can see his five rods and a bunch of screws. He had bones removed, he had a, a cage put in its place, and there he is, okay? Now look at this. I shrank, what, six, eight inches? And this guy is now a new life. He now graduated with a degree in engineering, he's been to Korea, he gives lectures. We've completely transformed his life. So this is a kid who, by sure, would have caught pneumonia and died at a young age, and now he has Endless possibilities. Okay. These two guys walked into my office. And the guy on the right, Solomon, what is his job? He's a S, okay? So he's an Ethiopian Orthodox priest. If you walk into a grocery store and you see somebody with a dark shirt and a white collar, you say to him, good morning, Father. You just know this guy's a priest. Well, this guy on the far right is wearing the garb of an Ethiopian Orthodox priest, and you would say the same thing, um, good morning, Father. So they walked into my office, and I said, can I help you? And they said, yeah, I want you to treat my brother. And so I said, 
I took my pen and I was writing the intake information, what's your name, where do you come from, all of this stuff. And I looked down at their feet and I said, you know, your shoes are in bad shape. They said, yeah, we walked here. And I said, you walked from the bus station? That's eight miles away. He said, no, 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 we, don't have, we didn't have $20 for a bus. We walked from Gojam. That's 250 miles. And I said, wait a minute, you walked from Gojam. How long did it take? And they said, eight days. And I said, you walked for eight days to get to me. But where'd you sleep at night? You can't sleep outside. There are hyenas. And he said, yeah. And then he just answered me with two words. He said, Xavier Engeda. Xavier Engeda means guest of God. Now, what he was saying, he was describing a whole traditional system of hospitality in the Ethiopian highlands, where you can knock on any door, and you can say, I'm a guest sent to you by God. Please give me a place to stay. They will open up their house to a stranger, cook you a meal, give you a place to sleep, which is probably the floor, <clears throat> give you water and soap to wash your feet, and show you out in the morning. They did this eight nights in a row. Nobody ever said no. Then they got to me, and I said, OK, tonight you stay at my house. And uh, they ended up moving into my house, and I was, their <clears throat> I was their host. So here's the kid. And he had been in school. He had been teased so much because of his back that he dropped out of school. There he is. Now here you can see. Um, this is a bar, so this is one, one, two, three, four, five bones that are fused. You can see it's trying here and here to defuse, but really it's one big block, and these need to be um, opened up manually, like it's a big deal surgery, but they can do that and correct it. So here's his spine. This is a reconstruction. There he is after his surgery, uh, lots of rods and screws. And then, you know, I had said he had been actually in a, in a program to teach handicapped young people how to be tailors. And he had these tailor skills. Well, he moved back into my house. We bought him, with the help of one of my donors, a sewing machine. And then COVID came along. He opened up a mask factory, and he was making masks in my living room, selling them, and donated half the profits to us so that other kids could get spine surgery. This is a letter from a, um, a mother giving permission for her daughter to have surgery, OK? This is a second permission. The kid was so close to being paralyzed permanently that Dr. Boachi called me from Ghana, and she said, we need a second permission. So we explained to her the situation. She agreed that he could, she, her daughter could get surgery. We wrote it out in Amharic. We wrote it out in English. And here, she's an illiterate woman, so she's signing with her thumbprint. And there, you can just feel her heart, the anguish she's had. And she's just praying for her daughter's recovery. Here's the daughter. That's her spine. Look at that. OK, it's a terrible spine. OK, and there she is. After her surgery, she was a bit paralyzed. She learned to walk again. and. Look at that. She's beautiful. We've completely transformed her life. So how do we do this? OK, so we send them to Accra, Ghana. And this is called halo gravity traction, or ambulatory traction. We drill four holes in the skull and place these screws against the skull. And they're in this walking traction for two months, four months, up to seven months. Now, this is a world's record picture. OK, we're the only people on the planet who have 15 kids in traction at the same time. So here you see a spring system. Here you see a pressure gauge. We've started off with five pounds of pressure. We go up to half their body weight. We go up to half their body weight, and we keep it there for months at a time. What do we do all day long as human beings? There's only three things we can do. We can lie down, we can walk, and we can sit. So here they are sitting, but they're getting stretched by the pulley system. Now, in the morning and the evening, when it's cooler, is the walking time. So the first 90 minutes, the last 90 minutes of the day, 
Here you can see these, and it, it looks, you'd think it would be painful, but you can clearly see these kids are not in pain. Here's the spring system, here's the pressure gauge, and they're walking along, getting their spine stretched, and we can get an up to a 50% correction before surgery by using this traction, and then they still need surgery. So here's my waiting list, and so now I have the largest collection of the worst spinal deformities in the world, and I'm working very hard to get them surgery, to raise money, and to train Ethiopian doctors so that they can do this in the future. Here's my partner, Dr. Ohana Bobuachi, wonderful, wonderful guy. We were seeing patients all day long at a Christian hospital. At the end of the day, I said, let's take a picture. Now, he's a very religious Christian, and he says, Rick, we need Jesus in the picture. So we stood there in front of Jesus, and I turned to him, and I said, two Jews and a Christian. <laughs> and he burst out laughing, and then we took the picture. And this is our kids. So you can see this kid on the far right started out with a spinal cord tumor. He was not able to walk. Now he's walking. The Michael Jordan was clearly would have died of TB of the spine. He's now a healthy orphan in fifth grade and so on. So uh, this is what we're doing. We go to work every day. We're working in the basement of a with an unventilated room in a crowded city hospital, but I couldn't be happier. And I also couldn't be happier than to see the wonderful hospitality of all of you. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's just remarkable. Um, my question is somewhat twofold. Do you feel that these spinal injuries are particular to Ethiopia, or are you just in this particular country and that's where you're seeing them? And then the second fold is, have you um, taken, like, considered looking into a potential genetic component that you could figure out through um, studies to see if there's a way to modify their genetics when they're younger to prevent them from getting so severe? What great question. So question number one, um, it is common in Ethiopia, but there's other countries in Africa where it's also common. Um, and also in Asia, for example, a lot of the early work on TB of the spine was done in Hong Kong. So it's a developing world problem, although there's plenty in Ethiopia. Part of it certainly is genetic. 5% of my patients have something called a neurofibromatosis. Um, and there's also, we have a bunch of cases running in families. So I'm looking for partners who can help me to do some genetic research. So the answer is yes. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. So, so the question is about early screening and surgery. So the indication for surgery is a 50-degree curve. Um, clearly, operating on a 50-degree curve is easier than operating on a 150-degree curve. And if it's greater than 100, you really need to put them in traction first, and that makes things much more difficult and expensive and so on. So now we're actually going, just over the last six months or so, during COVID, we started going to villages and going to areas, and I can just tell you my own experience with this in Bahadar a few weeks ago, that we rented space on the radio, and we told people that we're coming, and then we, had, we hired a car to drive through the town and say, there's a team coming from Addis Ababa, we're looking for people with spinal deformities, and we had 165 people show up. We had, and then hearing on the radio, we actually had one guy who came to us um, wearing, an, uh, with an IV in his arm, with his younger brother who had a spinal deformity. So the kid was 17 years old, and the older guy must have been 30, and he walked in, and I said to him, why do you have an IV, this is our clinic, but why are you wearing an IV? And he said, I was in the hospital, I had malaria, but I heard you were here, and we knew that this was his only chance, and so I walked out of the hospital, didn't finish my malaria treatment, and came to you. So that's 
are, are, we are doing screening and looking for easier cases that might be operated on inside Ethiopia. The other thing is, we, there's a woman, I can mention her name, Phyllis de Ambra, in um, Los Angeles. Phyllis is the world's expert on screening. She has personally screened half a million, half a million American kids for scoliosis. And she has given us two Zoom, private Zoom instructions on how to do school screening, and we're gonna be doing school screening uh, in the coming months. So thank you for asking. What happened to Danny, doctor? Danny? I thought nobody would ask. So Danny is now a student at Connecticut College. Um, he was adopted by the woman who brought him to me. And uh, he's doing great. Is there more propensity for uh, young males to get this than females? Or is there a cultural thing that you seem to get more male patients because perhaps families won't bring girls to a foreign doctor? Um, we have an equal number of males and females. I showed you more males in the picture because the males give me permission to show their bodies. Um, but I have plenty of female patients as well. Now, um, the TB of the, sp so TB of the spine, it's pretty much equal. Um, scoliosis in America is more female than male, and in Ethiopia it probably is as well, especially what they call AIS, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, but we have other reasons for Ethiopians to have scoliosis besides this, it, what they call AIS. So it's a, we have about 50-50. By the way, you should all come to Ethiopia. Uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. And uh, my conflict of interest statement, 100% conflict of interest, is that my son has a travel agency. <laughs> Hi. Um, first, thank you for all the work you do. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I work at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. And I was wondering if you ever worked with the spine surgeons there. Um, yeah, well, so Boachi was the chief there. Um, Matt Cunningham operated on one of my own kids. Oh, yep. Um, yeah. I know him. I know Hanjo. Um, Hanjo Kim? Yeah. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah, no, that's, and actually, I myself have had surgery at that hospital, oh. so um, I'm a big fan of HSS. Great. That's great to hear. Thanks. And, and, and you're putting rods in, that child's gonna grow. And, but yet you have a fixation component with the rods and screws. Um, how does that correlate with the growth of the child? So what we do, what we do with growing kids is there's something called growing rods. And there's two ways of doing growing rods, but they're basically overlapping rods. And either you put in the rods when they're, say, five, six years old, and then either you manually, manually adjust them by a 20-minute surgery um, every nine months or so, or some of them, the, some of the more modern ones are electromagnetic, and you just put the electromagnet. Like, we literally, um, my assistant in the last week has gotten permission for the Ghana team to come this weekend, bring the electromagnet into the country, and then you just put it on top of the person's back and it'll lengthen the rods. So you lengthen the rods to allow them to grow and to allow their chest to expand, and then you do the final fusion surgery in early puberty. Good question. I'm a little concerned about the um, halo. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? It seems like a very painful thing. It seems like a sling around the neck or the shoulders might be more, a little more comfortable. People but have suggested that, something. but um, 
the, the halo only hurts for the first two or three days. And after that, it doesn't hurt. Now, there is, I mean, there are all these problems you run into, and you know they can get infected, and you need to change the pins, and so on. Um, there's probably a 20, 25 percent infection rate, you know, in the best of circumstances, and you know this is done as well as it can be done. But so there's lots of problems that you run into, but they're pretty much fixable problems. I don't know of anyone who's done it a different way. Um, maybe they're thinking about it, but I don't know. Yes. A lot of kids with the halos uh, tolerate it from an emotional standpoint. Um, so, so, okay. As, so, as an American uh, physician, everybody's traumatized by everything. But they, in the picture, certainly, they seem, you know, there's no evidence of psychological trauma. So, so one of the things that we found, sort of inadvertently, is the idea of a therapeutic community. Like, for example, when I was treating, I diagnosed 3.5% of the Ethiopian Jews with active tuberculosis, and I was treating them. So I would be treating hundreds of people for tuberculosis, but we, we, joined, we formed our program so that they would, form a, they would be in a, inside a community, and they would support each other, and they had you know, discussions and social events and speeches by the religious leaders and so on. The same thing happens in Ghana. So we're sending 10 kids to Ghana at the same time. They bond together and they support each other. And the older ones encourage the younger ones and the girls are especially good with the young kids because you're sending five-year-olds without their moms. Um, and so it's the 15, the 18-year-old girls who are the surrogate moms in that case. And that helps a lot. So it's the community. It's the, they form a community. And then they have a Facebook group. And they come back to Ethiopia. And they're like together for life. And sometimes they actually use my clinic as a meeting place. So I'll go out into the waiting room. And I'll see people waiting. And I'll say to my nurse, like, you know, Abibich was here. She didn't come in. What's, did she didn't want to wait? And they said, no, she wasn't here to see you. And I said, why do you come to clinic if you don't want to see me? And they said, no, they come to meet their friends. And they go out for tea. Okay, hey, Solomon, stand up for a minute. Let me just int introduce you. <laughs> Solomon actually grew up in my house for how many years? Three years. Three years? And then, and then you went to Ohio for high school, and then you graduated from UMass Lowell, and now you're a chemical engineer for Pfizer. So, wow. Last question. So, when you have the children with less, lesser degree of scoliosis, have you started to do any studies to say how long you could put them in traction to prevent them from progressing? You know, when they're relatively mild, so that you could straighten them out and ideally stop the process? Like, can they go on a temporary um, stretching and then be released? So nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing traction to prevent scoliosis progression. But they are doing bracing. So if they have an angle between 25 and 40 degrees, then we can brace them. And if they're little kids, we can put them in a body cast, and they do casting. Well, thank you very much.